Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is a mini lesson on engaging in argumentation from Evidence Level 3, Presenting Arguments. When you're presenting an argument, an argument should always be based in evidence. And in this video, we're going to go through a lot of evidence and see how you can evaluate that evidence. Remember, the evidence comes from a question that we're trying to answer. So whenever you're looking at an argument or presenting an argument, first thing you should always do is, is figure out what's the question that I'm actually trying to answer. And that'll help you a little bit in your argument. The next thing you want to do when you're making an argument is to come up with a claim based on evidence and reasoning. Now your argument will be presented in this fashion, but a lot of the time what we want to do is we want to evaluate the evidence. And so when you're evaluating the evidence, you really want to be looking for the sufficiency of the evidence. Do we have enough evidence that we could actually make a claim? And the two things or the components of efficiency are Number one, is the, is the data or evidence reliable? And then is it valid? And so after watching this video, you should be able to present arguments around questions related to energy transfer in uh, Newton's cradle, or which is the best vacuum. But what I'm gonna do is start by just showing you how to present an argument around these different types of scales, and then you'll have a chance to do the same with these skew dice. So let me clean this up and then we'll get started. All right, so for this uh, argument, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be dealing with different scales, a lab scale, spring scale, kitchen scale, and music scale. And what we used them to do was to just measure some pennies. And so let me write down the question that we're trying to answer. Okay, so the question that we're trying to answer is which of the scales, so we've got four scales, lab, kitchen, spring, and music, which of these is the most effective? That's the question that we're trying to answer. We're trying to present a, a argument. So one thing that we should always do is look at the definition. So effective scale, let's look at the definition of scale effectiveness. So if we look at the definition, a measure of the quality of a lab scale. It combines accuracy, in other words, being close to the true value, precision, a consistency of measurements, and then the ease of use. Is it user friendly? This ensures a reliable and simple operation. And so as we look at this, we're gonna have a lot of evidence on the back of these cards, but the one thing we should do is, which of this evidence is not valid at all? So we're gonna be measuring the mass of a penny, as a way to just see how, how precise it is. And so you can tell right away that a music scale is not gonna be helpful. So this evidence might be interesting, it's the word scale, but it's not valid to what we're doing. And so I'm just gonna pitch that and get rid of this. Um, we also wanna keep this definition up here. So we've got our scale effective, effectiveness up here. But what we wanna now do is just start to look at the evidence. So I'm just gonna look at the evidence that's on the other side. And so as I look at the evidence and scan the evidence, one thing you always wanna do when you're looking at evidence is you wanna just look at the figures at the bottom. So in every bit of evidence, there's always gonna be a figure on the bottom that will tell you more about the evidence. And so for example, in the spring scale, figure one tells us that this has got penny measurement on it. So we've got data on the measurement of pennies. It also has a user rating, so it looks like out of a five-star rating it has it. And then it says that all the measurements are made in grams and the accepted value for a penny is 2.50 grams. And so as I look at this evidence, I would say this seems to be pretty valid evidence so far. If we're determining what a scale is, it's got how is that scale used to measure the mass of pennies, you can see the same thing is included on the lab scale and the same thing is included in the kitchen scale. And so what we want to do is we want to start summarizing the evidence. So we want to put that evidence right here in the argument. Remember, before you ever make a claim, you want to look through the evidence. And so what I think I'll do is I'll just go through each of these scales and then I'm going to evaluate the evidence when it comes to measuring the mass of a penny. And so let me kind of summarize that right here.
All right, so I'm summarizing the evidence now in figure one, figure two, and figure three. So if we look at figure one, just the summary, what I said is that the spring scale, the average value that it got for the penny, so if we look at the average value that it got, was two. So two grams is what it got for the penny, and we know from the figure description that it should be 2.50. And so as we think about this spring scale, we would say, it is definitely answering the question, but we would say it's not very, getting very close to the value. In other words, we would say it's not very accurate according to the definition or close to the value. For the next one, we should be looking at precision or the consistency of measurements. And so if you look at the consistency, as you look across, there were three trials. And with each of these trials, you have high variability in what we were getting from the scale. And so what we call this in science is precision, but it really gets at the reliability of the data as well. So the spring scale is not very reliable. We keep getting different answers, and that's why we have such a big range of one to six grams. It also has a two star rating. So the scale is not very useful. It says difficult to read and awkward to hang the pennies. As we look at the next one, which is going to be the lab scale, we can see that its penny average was way closer to the accepted value. So it's 2.49. And so as we look back to here, it is accurate, we would say, or close to the value. And that means this is really valid, uh, we could say, is how close is it? The next one, when we look at the range, you can see that there's not much variability in each of these different trials. The range was only 0.02 to 0.07 grams. And then it has a five star rating. So this is a wonderful scale. And then if we look at the last one, we can see the kitchen scale is that it, it was a penny average of two as well, very similar to the spring scale. Its range is much smaller, so we could say it's more precise, or we might use that word reliable over time. And then it has a four star rating. So what I might do, since we're trying to figure out what's the most effective, I might put it in order. So for me at this point, I think I would put it in that order with the lab scale seeming to be the most at least effective so far based on kind of the data that we have. So that's a summary of the data. The next thing I wanna do is I wanna make some kind of a claim. A claim again is just going to be what I believe an answer to the question might be. And so that's easy. And then the next thing I have to do is I have to have some reasoning. So what reasoning would I have here that connects the evidence back to the claim? So let me write some of that evidence. Okay, so as I summarize the reasoning, what I went through and did is just said, lab scale is most accurate, it's gonna be the most precise, and it's the most user-friendly. Um, if we look at the kitchen scale, the kitchen scale is gonna be somewhat accurate, precise, and user-friendly, and the spring scale is gonna be somewhat accurate, low precision, not user-friendly. Now again, I'm just restating the evidence, and so I really need this uh, sentence over here. Since the lab scale scores highest in the three criteria, I'm going back to the definition for scale effectiveness, it is the most effective scale. And so again, as you look at evidence, the first thing you wanna do is just go over the evidence. What are we looking through? Validity, so is the evidence valid to answer the question? Remember, we got rid of the music scale earlier. And then is the data reliable? And so not only is the lab scale reliable, but just by looking at that, we're able to get a better understanding of what kind of data we're looking for as we're looking for good data. It's data that is consistent through multiple trials and it has more precision. And so this is me laying out and presenting an argument based on scale effectiveness. What I'm gonna do now is clean this up and then you're gonna have a chance to evaluate some different evidence to answer a question, just looking for validity and reliability. And so let me pause for a second. Okay, for the next one, we're gonna use what are called skew dice. As you look at skew dice, they look kind of like dice, but kind of not like dice. And so I've got some skew dice here. They look a little bit different than normal dice. And so the first thing that a lot of people ask when you see skew dice is,
are skew dice fair? And so uh, I've got a definition for fair dice. I also have a bunch of data. So I have six data sets that are down below. And so what I'd encourage you to do is go through the data, first sort out what evidence is actually gonna be valid would help us answer this question. And then go through and write an argument that's got a summary of the evidence, it's got a claim, and it's got reasoning. Then unpause the video and then come back and we'll see how our arguments are going to be similar and how they might be different. Okay, so the first thing I would do is I would look at the definition. So fair dice are dice for which the probability of a pattern over all possible outcomes is uniform. That means for a standard six-sided dice, that means that the chance of getting a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, and a six is exactly one-sixth. And so that's gonna be really important, this definition for fair dice, especially when we get to our reasoning. The next thing I would do if we get these dice out of the way is we wanna look at the evidence. And so we've got evidence on skew dice average mass. So this is a bunch of skew dice were weighed and we can have their average mass. The next is on skew dice roll distribution. So this is, it looks like lots of rolls and how many came up on each of the different numbers. We've also got normal dice roll distribution. We've got some same kind of numbers there. We've got skew dice roll distribution with a double roll. So you get a kind of curve that looks like that. We've got normal roll with uh, double rolls. And then we've got skew dice surface area. And so this looks like how much area is covered by the skew dice. And so we've got a lot of evidence. And so the first thing we would wanna do is figure out which of this data could we get rid of and which of it might we wanna use. And so if I were to say which data is not gonna help us, I don't think the mass of a skew dice is gonna help us. It's not gonna help us on the probability. I mean, it might be weighted, but I don't know how putting on it a scale might tell us that. So I would probably pitch this data. And then I would start to, I think this is good together because we could look at skew dice roll versus normal, skew dice roll versus normal when we do a double roll. And I think the surface area might be important because if it's the same surface area on each side, it's more likely, if one was bigger, I guess, then it's more, more likely to fall on that side. And so the first thing I would do is I'm gonna go through and just look at the evidence and let's just kind of summarize the evidence that we have. Okay, as I summarize the data, as we look at the data here, so this is gonna be figures two and three, the normal and the skew dice average around 16%. And as you look at just visually, look at the bar charts or the bar graph, it's really hard to tell which is going to be which. So I think that's good evidence that they may be fair. As we look at the double roll, it shows a normal distribution curve. So you kind of see a nice curve that we see a lot of the time just in a normal, statistically normal kind of a data set. And in both of them, seven is the most common just because you can roll that in a lot of different ways. And then for figure six, all sides are approximately 0.4 inches squared. So as we look at the data, I think all of this data is fairly valid. I think all of this data is valid. I think this data is valid, but it sure would be nice to have some more data on just normal dice. We don't have that. As we look at the reliability, since we rolled it here, it looks like 370 rolls. I think that's valid. This is 180 double rolls, so that seems not only valid, but reliable. And then it's really hard to tell how reliable this is because there's only really one trial when they did it. So I'd say all of this is highly valid. We're maybe missing a little bit of data here and we're not sure how reliable this is based on the data that we have. So I would say pretty good so far. So the next thing we would do is now we gotta make a claim and we gotta use some reasoning.
Okay, so my claim is that yes, the skew dice are at least as fair as normal dice. Um, I said figure two and three, this evidence is important since we got 16%, remember, each time. If you divide 100% by six, you should get about 16.7. So that matches up fairly well to a one in six probability. As we look at the next one, they both follow a normal distribution. And then the last one, since all the sides are the same, we would hope that there's uh, the same likelihood that one of them is going to end up on the downside. Uh, and we may want to get some other evidence. We could look at like what are the sides on a normal dice to see if they're equal as well and even how do they compare to skew dice. So if for me, I would say at this point, my argument would be are the skew dice fair? I would say yes, and this is me laying it out. But it's important to remember, what if I only rolled one dice once and I rolled it again and I got six both times? Well, is that enough evidence? Is it reliable enough or valid enough for me to make a claim? No. And so it's really important that you have enough evidence before you start to make claims. And so that's how you start to present an argument. You always start with the evidence before you make any kind of a claim. Now that we've done that for skew dice, you could try some other data sets down below. I've got one on, I guess the first one would be on the vacuums and which one might be the best vacuum, or you could look at energy transfer in something like the Newton's cradle. But that's how you present an argument. Always go with the evidence and then use the evidence to convince other people. And I hope that's helpful.